Um, so thanks everyone who's joined. Uh, so my name is Andy Lake. Uh, I'm from ESNet. I'm one of the developers on the Persona project. Uh, today I'll be presenting along with uh, Michael Johnson from uh, the EDN University GRNOC and uh, Mark Fayette from Internet2. Um, and we'll be talking about uh, Persona 4.0, uh, which I hope is what you all expected. Uh, so uh, we'll be do a quick overview of stuff, but I think probably a lot of you are familiar with that. So we're hoping to kind of dive a little bit deeper than we have in some previous presentations on a few features. And I'll highlight what those will be. Um, and then at the end, we will take questions. There's a chat in Zoom. Um, so you, you guys can post your questions there. Uh, because of my monitor setup, I don't know if I'll, I, will, I will see them as, <laughs> as I'm presenting, uh, but, but we'll definitely try and get as many of those as we can at, at the end at least. Um, so let's, let's dive in. Um, so, uh, first up, so I think probably a lot of uh, a lot of you already know this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but uh, just a brief, brief recap of what Persona is for anybody that might be new. Uh, so Persona is uh, a set of tools uh, for helping identify uh, network performance problems um, and hopefully maybe even help, help solve them. Um, and we do this all kind of in multi-domain environments uh, generally. Uh, which creates some interesting challenges. Uh, we have some good, good, good presentations highlighting those challenges. Um, and, and but basically, the the way we do this at the end of the day is we run basically a standard set of tools. Uh, you know, collect the results and then publish them in a standard way. And then we provide tools for for visualizing and analyzing those. Um, and, and people can also write their own tools because we write lots of APIs and things like that. Um, so that that's kind of the the quick uh, quick persona recap. Um, what the current version, or I guess I should say really previous version, because the current version is now 4.0, um, uh, looked like in terms of the various pieces uh, was in that diagram there. Uh, so the previous version was called Persona 3.5. Uh, it, it, this architecture has looked more or less the same for, for a number of years now. Maybe a few of the names on boxes have switched, but it, it's, been, it's been more or less, more or less the same for, for quite a while now. Um, and so you'll see, uh, uh, basically, if we start down at the bottom, there's this purple box. Uh, those are your basic measurement tools. Uh, so, so stuff like TraceRoute and TracePath, um, or iPerf and iPerf3, or the, the OAMP tools for just measuring uh, various various uh, aspects of, of the network. Um, and you know, all those have command line tools that you can run, but you know, kind of the one add-on of, of PerfSonar was the scheduling layer that's above. Um, and in 3.5, our scheduling layer was a little bit confusing. Uh, it actually consists of two pieces. One piece is BWCL, uh, which actually kind of maintained a schedule and executed most of the tools. Um, and then sitting on top of that was actually another piece called regular testing, which made sure BWCL got kicked off and also handled some stuff that BWCL didn't, like uh, uh, the OAMP tool PowStream, which continuously runs uh, uh, one-way latency measurements uh, in the background. Um, so that's kind of always been a confusing aspect. But um, anyways, that layer would, uh, would gather everything up um, and then ship it up to our archiving layer, which is this light blue box that says Esmond in it. Um, and then once it was archived, we had tools that could actually look at the data and display it and, and do other interesting things with it. So kind of our tool main tools are our graphs that probably a lot of you are familiar with and Mad Dash, which creates these dashboards of, uh, and grids uh, basically with uh, uh, red, red, green, yellow, although you know you can change the colors and, and they've, they've Changed a little bit over, over time um, to, to indicate, you know, how well things are performing. Um, on top of that, uh, or kind of next to that too, in, in terms of setting this all up, we have this orange box, which is the configuration layer that consisted of two pieces: the mesh config component, which uh, at, uh, in, in this version basically could download remote JSON files, determine what tests this this host, the particular host, is supposed to be running, and then and set up the, the scheduling layer to behave accordingly. Uh, likewise, we had the, the uh, graphical user interface or the web interface uh, that a lot of you are probably familiar with on your toolkit, which could also, uh, you could define tasks and set them up that way. And then the last piece is this green box over all the way on the right, uh, which is the discovery component the, or the lookup service registration daemon, uh, which basically publishes the existence of all these other components over here uh, into the lookup service so they can be found and uh, we have like nice, nice maps displaying them and, and things like that. Um, so that, that was 3.5. So what changes in Persona 4.0? Um, so a few things, um, and we'll dig deeper on a, a few of these today. Uh, the biggest is P-Scheduler, 
uh, which replaces that, that scheduling layer I was talking about with just one component um, and also adds a whole bunch of new features that, that Mark's going to talk about uh, that, that uh, I think really, uh, really make things nice. Um, uh, we also updated the graphs. Um, so basically a uh, cleaner display of, of lots of different types of data um, because, you know, uh, we, people are often looking at, at multiple different types of data at once and, and before it was kind of messy. Uh, we've cleaned that up a little bit and Mike will be showing some of that. Uh, and then Mad Dash 2.0. So our dashboards that I was talking about, uh, we've added, the biggest thing we've added is something that's been requested for a long time is the ability to actually alert or and send emails when, when problems are found. So I'll be talking about a, a little bit of that as well. Um, and then the last thing, which maybe isn't um, maybe isn't as visible as the other things, but important nonetheless, is uh, we have now um, support CentOS 7. Um, and in fact, if you want to do an ISO install, which we'll talk about later, that you only can do CentOS 7. Uh, and we also now support the toolkit package on Debian 8. Before we supported other bundles, but not the toolkit package, so those are now supported as well. Um, so what did we remove from Persona Point Point Oh? So this is a hot topic on the list. Uh, um, um, past couple days, so I just wanted to recap this for everyone. So since we are migrating to CentOS 7, uh, uh, we basically lose the ability to do the Web 100 kernel, um, which the Web 100 kernel is a, a pretty old patch at this point um, that we've applied to the kernel for a long time in support of really the only tool that we officially support is NDT. We used to support something called NPAD. I think we dropped support for that a few years ago just because it wasn't maintained anymore. Um, so, so basically, this patch doesn't work with the, the kernel that ships to CentOS 7, and there's really not a good way to make it work with the, the, the CentOS 7 kernel. So um, we've had to drop support for that. Um, uh, so you know, I think there's some confusion. Uh, just to clarify, if you have an existing host that has NDT on it, um, like you're upgrading from a previous version of Persona that has NDT installed, or if you installed NDT separately, we will not. We're not doing it. We won't remove it. It'll still be there. It's just not included in the dependencies anymore. So it should still be there. Um, there was an issue where there were some firewall ports getting blocked. We actually just pushed out an update last night that 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 wasn't really the intent. Um, I think we were just being a little overzealous uh, uh, with our up firewall rules there. Uh, those should be open back up if you're running DDT, NDT now. Um, so you know. Hopefully, if you have an NDT install that you're using, it still works. Um, in terms of, we will continue to build Web 100 kernels for the next six months. Um, so that brings us to October 17th, um, just to give people time to transition. So there's one kind of uh, in the process now of being built that'll probably come out today or tomorrow um, because there was a new kernel release. So we'll continue doing that till October, but at, after October, we won't do it anymore. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of fans of the NDT tool out there. Um, you know, we're not saying that the NDT use case is, is um, you know, not a valid one. We're just saying as part of the Persona project, you know, we, we're not going to be doing, you know, NDT type stuff. Um, and, and honestly, we really haven't ever. We kind of just included NDT as a tool. Um, we did have a developer a few years ago who contributed some stuff to it, but he's, he's left the project. Um, so, you know, they get associated a lot with each other, but um, they've kind of always been separate things. Um, so we're, we're just kind of getting out of that, that, that space. Um, but the measurement lab project at Google uh, actually does quite a bit with NDT. Um, and Matt Mathis presented on this uh, a while back, um, and, and we've confirmed with them this is still in their plans. But right now they're focusing on upgrading the, the measurement lab platform, which is taking up a lot of their time. Um, but once that's complete, uh, towards the top of their list is uh, migrating tools that use Web 100 to just use, you know, plain old TCP info, which is included in the stock kernel, and that includes NDT. So I don't think NDT is going to die or go away. It's just not going to be part of the Persona project. So hopefully, hopefully that clarifies a few things. Um, so with all that being said, this is basically what a version of that, that picture I showed earlier for 3.5, uh, what it looks like. So we'll see it looks, uh, a lot of it looks the same. Um, the big changes are uh, the, the scheduling layer now is just one component. It's a lot simpler. Everything, everything goes through it. There's no exception. Um, uh, just, just a lot cleaner. Um, this configuration box has changed a little bit. We're not going to be talking a ton about that today. We'll probably uh, have another presentation that talks about some of that there. Um, but, but basically, the mesh config now just plays a bigger role in, in um, configuring tests. So uh, basically, your local tests, that you find through the GUI um, and your remote meshes all, all kind of get fed through the mesh config, which then kind of becomes the transaction manager for P scheduler and just make sure tasks get submitted there that are supposed to. Um, we also have this new box, again, that we're not going to show today uh, with a GUI for setting up uh, meshes for multiple hosts. 
Um, and uh, that, that's still in beta form, um, but, but it is available. I think that you should be able to find some documentation on docs.perfsonar.net. And like I said, we'll probably be talking about that more at a, at a later presentation. Um, so today's focus will be the stuff I have highlighted here. So we'll talk about some of the visualization components, the graphs and Mad Dash, and then we'll spend a, hopefully a good chunk of time uh, talking about P scheduler. Um, so that, that's all the intro information. So I'll, I'll start off. Um, I'm, I've got a couple slides on some of the new Mad Dash features. Um, so let's jump into those. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, changes for, for Mad Dash, this is Mad Dash 2.0. Um, uh, the big big change is uh, we basically integrated a feature that was uh, written by University of Mich uh, some developers at the University of Michigan as part of the Pungent project. Uh, what they were doing was taking the Mad Dash API uh, and basically analyzing the grids and looking for patterns and then creating reports based on those. Um, so that was really cool. So uh, we worked with them and uh, integrated the code into the, the kind of main uh, Mad Dash code base. Um, and uh, so now there's basically a REST API to the reports, but because we have that, we can now, we uh, upgraded the Mad Dash kind of uh, interface to look at them. So the graphical interface, you can see example of that on the side. side. So um, now uh, basically the difference is we're highlighting some of these host names. So like uh, that first one, ANL border dash PS, you know, is, is now highlighted orange because all those boxes are orange. Um, the third one down is highlighted kind of that purplish, purple, pin, uh, purple pinkish color um, that basically replaces red. It's a little more colorblind friendly. Basically, it's highlighting the fact that it's performance problems, and you can click that for more detail. Uh, so, so basically, just drawing attention to to problems and common patterns more. Um, so then, on top of that, then since we can identify these patterns, um, we now kind of have the ability to generate more useful email notifications. Uh, the holdup before was always that we didn't want to be sending an email every time half a box you know change color or something like that to people uh, just because that's not useful um and, and the most useful part of these dashboards is really the ability to see patterns and um you know if we could kind of automate some of that that pattern recognition um and generate emails on that no, that's what we wanted to be able to do um so so that that's that's what Matt alert has kind of allowed us allowed us to do um so there's two ways to uh to do email notifications i'll, I'll talk about both of these uh, one is just natively in Mad Dash. Mad Dash can send emails. You basically add some configuration telling it what you want to send, and it will send them out. Um, the second is we have a set of Nagios checks. So if you have a, uh, an existing Nagios deployment, um, you could try integrating with that and using basically the Nagio alerting features um, if you so desire. We know there's lots of other frameworks out there. Um, we don't have any plugins at this time, but there is an API. So if anybody's interested in writing plugins, it's actually not, not terribly difficult. Um, so let me jump into the native notifications. So the way you set these up is um, if you've used Mandash before, the main configuration file is called mandash.yaml, that, that path uh, shown in the slides. Um, and basically now you can optionally add a new notification section, which uh, uh, I've shown on the, the right and left here. So the right is kind of the start of it and it, it's your kind of most basic notification. Um, so this notification section is actually a list, so you can define multiple of these. So if you want to send, you know, different information to different people, um, you have the ability to do that. You don't have to just have like one one set of rules for, you know, all your emails. Um, so so the first the, on the the left there um, is kind of your most basic uh, uh, ba basic uh, configuration, right? So you have a name, which is essentially the subject of your email type. Email, which is really the only type of notification that, that um, Mad Dash currently supports. That's just there for a future extension if, if we so desire. Um, so that'll always be email. You have that third option, schedule, which is this cron like string. Um, what it's saying there is to run every hour at the top of the hour. Um, so that's basically how often it will look for problems and send an email if it finds any. Um, and then this problem report frequency. So our schedule will run every hour. Um, it might be the case that it runs, it sees a problem, it runs again, it sees the same problem. You don't necessarily want to be getting emailed every hour about the same thing. Maybe you do, you can configure that. But what this does is say, don't basically send the same problem, you know, more than once a day. Um, it's in seconds, so that's what 86,400 is. Um, then we have this minimum severity option. Zero is, you know, okay. One is, I think, uh, warning and two is critical. So basically, this is saying anything warning or, or worse, send me an email about. Um, and then there's some parameters down here, like the dashboard URL is just the URL to your dashboard that it just uses that within the email to generate uh, hyperlinks back to the dashboard. Um, then you can set the from address and then a list of two addresses. So you can you know, send it to multiple people, you can send it to a mailing list, whatever, whatever you want. 
Um, so, so that's just your basic kind of example that'll send any problems uh, in an email to, and it'll send all the problems kind of in the same email. It's all, it's all consolidated. Um, uh, it'll send any problems in, in one email every, every hour uh, to that, that address. Now, uh, if you want to get a little bit, um, you know, more, more complicated, um, the example on the right kind of shows that it adds, it's, it's very similar to the other one, except it adds this uh, highlighted option called filters. Um, so there's four different types of filters. Two of them are shown here. So one is category. Um, category is kind of a special uh, 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 special option um, that basically these alerts are defined by rules. Um, you get a default set of rules and you can categorize something as a performance or configuration issue. So this, this one's saying uh, performance issue, which is things that are generally, if you're using the default color scheme, you know, yellow and red things, you know, throughput is below a certain threshold and stuff like that. A configuration is more when things are like uh, using the default color scheme orange, meaning you know it, it can't figure out what's going on. It's usually a configuration thing. Um, the other one, uh, another type is dashboard, which is also shown here. So dashboards are groups of the grids shown in uh, Mad Dash, right? So you can basically say only send me problems that belong to the set of grids that are in this dashboard. Um, and so in this case, there's you know a dashboard called collaboration dashboard. So it'll send any performance problems it finds in the collaboration dashboard. Um, and then uh, the other two that not aren't shown are grid, which if you want to look at just an individual grid. Um, so like you know it would probably be collaboration throughput dashboard, or I'm sorry, collaboration throughput grid or something like that is what it would be named. Um, you can do that. And then there's also a site option. So if you want to look at you know basically just stuff that affects a particular host, which would be the row or column in a grid. Uh, you can do that as well. You can also define multiple of these of the same type. So if you wanted to look at, you know, collaboration dashboard one and collaboration dashboard two, you can do that. Um, and it's basically treated like an or condition. So um, uh, you can look at kind of multiple dashboards and multiple things of the same type, multiple hosts if you're using the site. Um, and then, you know, you can ship it off somewhere else to like the collaboration mailing list or whatever. So um, hopefully that's, that's kind of clear. Um, we're still finishing up the documentation on that, but there's an example in the default Mad Dash config file, and you know, hopefully between the slides, you, you can probably figure out a lot of it, and um, we'll be finishing up that documentation in the next couple of days. So, um, then the second way is with a Nagios check. So the Nagios check is actually pretty simple. You just give it a Mad Dash URL and a grid name, uh, and it will basically look at that grid for any problems. You can also optionally give it a site name, so it'll just look at a row in the grid or a column. Um, and look for any problems and that that should fit in pretty well with kind of the host centric view that most Nagio setups have So you can basically set this up and you know iterate over the, the name of the site or, or whatever So, uh, you know, we're this is kind of you know, we're looking for feedback on this uh, So if you play with this, if there's things you'd find that make it easier set in your Nagio setup uh, You know, that would be good to know but, uh, that that's available as well. So and that ends Mad Dash stuff. So uh, I think next up is Michael. So I will hand audio over to him at least so Okay, thanks, Andy. Uh, as Andy mentioned, I'm Michael Johnson. I'm a software developer at the Global Lock in Indiana University, and I mainly work on the graphs and the toolkit GUI for, for Sonar. So let me share my screen here. Okay, here's a look at the new graphs. Um, they're all they're all new in, in 4.0, and uh, they were de developed with a with a usability designer and a web designer, um, the same team that worked on the new toolkit GUI in the Perfsonar 3.5 release. Um, we've improved the looks and usability. There's a whole pile of new features. Um, it's more or less responsive. You, uh, so if you resize the window or you have a small browser, it works okay. But it's it still works best with a high resolution display. Um, much improved performance, and it's built using the React time series time series charting library from ESNet. Uh, it's also more extensible than the framework we previously had. So overall, the new graph allows us to see all the throughput throughput results on one graph, loss on another, and then latency on a third graph. Uh, and there are separate graphs for IPv4 and v6. I have an example of that here. So this row is throughput IPv4, this row is throughput IPv6, et cetera. Um, so now we're able to show more 
details on you know in a less cluttered space without having you know, 15 lines running over each other so looking through, over the interface at the top we have a header that shows you the source and destination hosts as with their host names and addresses you can click host info to see more details about the host including the capacity and mtu uh, and a tracer out graph if that's been collected these details come from the lookup service so in some cases you like this host is not in a lookup service so we don't have details on it um, moving over to the right you have the report range um, clicking on the left arrow takes you back in time and clicking on the right arrow takes you further and forward in time you can change the the report range if you want to see a smaller time frame or a larger time frame uh, below that is, is it lists the start and end date and time including the, the time zone there's also a share open in new window button. This is mostly useful if you want to open this in a new window. Usually you would want to do that if you're looking at it within the Mad Dash, Mad Dash interface. Uh, although it's also good if you, want to, if you want to copy and paste the link, you can get it from here. Uh, at the top of the graph is a, is a selection bar that allows you to, to toggle different test types on and off. So we have TCP throughput, we have loss from throughput UDP tests, OAMP loss, ping loss, packet retransmitted packets, latency, and which is one-way latency, and ping latency, which is round-trip latency. You can also select forward or, or, or high and forward and reverse data. And, and we also have test failures, which shows you the error messages for tests that have failed. As you move the cursor over the graph, you, you see an overlay that shows you the values for those, those graphs. Um, so in this list, you have at the top, the, the timestamp at that particular point in time, as well as, as IPv4 and v6 throughput loss and latency values. These can be collapsed and expanded using the plus and minus buttons here. Uh, clicking anywhere on the graph will will freeze the overlay in place, or, and clicking again will will unlock it. Um, and for each test type, we have the direction of the of the test. So to the right is forward, to the to the left is reverse. Uh, the the value and units, protocol, and also the tool that was used to perform the test. So in this case, we have two sets of throughput data because we're running iperf3 and NUT TCP tests. Um, similarly for loss, we have percent loss as well as account of packets lost and account sent, um, as well as whether that was a one-way latency or a ping test, and the, the tool that was used to perform the, that test as well. Uh, similar, this, the same holds true for latency. Um, and then if it, these red dots on the graph are test failures where something didn't run properly. So it, it shows that what type of test it was, what direction it was running in, gives you the error message as well as the tool that was used in the test. Let's see anything. Uh, we also have packet retransmits plotted on the graph. So this here's a different graph that has an example of that. This shows the the uh, you know, purple dots are the are tests that had retransmitted packets, and there. And additionally, in the overlay, there's a listing of how many retransmitted packets were seen at that point. Uh, one thing that's not immediately um, obvious is as you're mousing over the the values. You, you see a number of different tests here. Um, this is showing all the tests that the graphs see on the entire graph. So if, so if you have trouble figuring out where those values come from, like, like in this right here, this value isn't changing. So, but if you, if you mouse further over to the left, you see there are values. So uh, it's just that when, when you leave that test, it doesn't remove that from the overlay. So that's something we hope to improve in future versions. Uh, so it's less confusing. 
Michael, there's a question from Alex in the chat about what options there are to change the uh, date range that's shown. Yeah, sure. So, thank you. Uh, right, right now, you, you can you can only choose a certain uh, you know a day, three days, week, month, or a year. Um, and once you do that, you can you can zoom in and out, like you just would by scrolling up and down. Um, so there's some some zooming that you can do. The, there is no ability to do a, a custom range right now. Uh, there, that's something that we plan on adding, but it, it's not there yet. Um, if if you if you wanted to, you could play with the URL that that is being used and change the start and end timestamps to match whatever you want to see. So that's a kind of more advanced way of of playing around with it. But but right now we only have these these options. Um, so in the future, yeah, we're going to have some more usability improvements, more control over what values are being displayed. We want to add more details about test parameters, such as in this case, we have, uh, you know, the uh, UDP throughput test is maxing out at 50 megs, and that's not because, well, let me show and that's not because the you know the, the link can only handle 50 megs. It's just that that's the limit that's set. So in the test configuration, so we want to be able to show those test parameters to the users, so you can you can make correlations like that. Um, we want to add more details about the hosts that are involved in the test as well. Um, questions? And I haven't really been following chat there. Okay, looks like not. And I think uh, I think Mark is going to be talking about peace scheduler next. Okay. I think I'll just grab the video from you. All right, Mark, and I'll, I can share the slides. So. Oh, okay, I got it already. Everybody see that? Okay, I'll assume so. Um, my name is Mark Fite. I'm uh, I work for Internet Two, and I'm our, our full time engineer on uh, here on the Personar project. And uh, my little piece of of, uh, of Personar 4.0 is called P Scheduler. Um, if you're not familiar with Personar, which I assume most of you already are, uh, I would tell you that P Scheduler is a piece of software for the scheduling, supervision, and archiving of test measurements. Um, if you are familiar with Personar. I would tell you that it is a complete replacement for the VWCTL that everyone is familiar with and we've been using for, uh, for a long time. Um, why replace VWCTL is kind of a question we got asked a little bit. Um, the, the big reason is that parts of it are just becoming kind of creaky with age and difficult to, uh, difficult to maintain. Um, so um, the, the architecture of it has has made a lot of um, a lot of community requested features that, that you know people have been asking us for kind of difficult to, imp to implement. So when I got onto the project, um, I don't know about 18 months ago, um, one of my first uh, one of my first tasks was to do a, an ex a pretty extensive evaluation of BWCTL, BWCTL2, and uh, whether we should either continue maintaining one of those or um, or do something with a with a clean slate. And that's we decided that a clean slate implementation. Was uh, was kind of the right thing to do. Oops, pardon me. Um, the the big improvement that uh, or the biggest improvement, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry, we missed a slide. Um, so just to kind of to to kind of hit some of the some of the highlights of of what's uh, what's changed in, in P Scheduler, um, we bring with it first off support for everything that BWCTL supported um, and more. And we'll talk about the and more in the next slide, which you've kind of seen a little bit of, a little bit of already. Um, it gives us visibility into what happened, what's happening now, and what will happen in the future. Um, P Scheduler, unlike BWCTL, actually runs with a timeline that schedules its activities well in advance. Uh, by default, we have that set to 24 hours right now. Um, so as long as there, if you have regular, regular tests running, any of that sort of thing, um, you'll actually be able to see that in the schedule and you'll be able to see what um, you know, what's, what's planned, kind of use that for, for planning your testing activities. Um, something else that we do a lot of, uh, measurement diagnostics, we try, to, we try to put diagnostics in wherever we can so that you don't have to log into the system and pick through the logs and figure out what happened. 
Um, we try to store all that stuff with the measurement results so that, um, so that when, you, when you need it, it's right there. You don't have to go hunt for it. Um, what used to be called regular testing has been baked into the core of the system. We just call it repeating testing, and it's, it's kind of a feature, of, um, it's kind of, a feature of, of everything that you do with P-Scheduler. If you, if you give it a task to do, you can, tell it, um, you can tell it you want to repeat what the interval is, um, and it will take care of it. Um, there's no special development for new tests or anything else like that. It, it, all, just, uh, it all just sort of works. Um, we've also done a much more powerful system for imposing policy limits, um, or what, what you call limits. Um, and we have a bunch of new features in that, including the ability to do things like download lists of IP addresses um, from external sources and a few other things that uh, there's uh, some other presentations I can, I can do that, uh, that go into that. Um, additionally, we've also made the, the archiving system reliable um, so that if, if the system makes an attempt to archive one of your measurements and fails for whatever reason, there are provisions for it to retry. Um, we have a system set up whereby the things that do the archiving get to make the decisions about whether or not we retry and, and, and how long before the next attempt is. Um, so there's a whole bunch of flexibility in that as well. Um, in addition to shipping the Esmond archiver, which everyone is familiar with, um, we have a, a whole stack of, of archivers that, uh, that we ship with, uh, one of which will let you send your test results directly to RabbitMQ, and another one will let you, uh, let you post results with, uh, with HTTP, which will give you a whole bunch more options. If you have other systems that you want to send the results to, you no longer have to dump them into Esmond and use, use something else to pull them out of Esmond and send them, uh, send them where you want. The big improvement, at least uh, this is my favorite anyway, is, is extensibility. Um, a lot of the stuff that was hardwired into BWCTL has been delegated into a system of plugins that allows uh, third party or, you know, we've, we of course use this ourselves, but it allows uh, integration of new tests, which are things to measure. Um, that's sort of an important point there. We've sort of, uh, we've, we've ab abstracted the concept of, of what a test is. And we'll talk about that in a future slide. Um, you can integrate new tools, which are things that carry out the measurements. And you could also integrate new archivers, which are just ways to dispose of the results. Um, so if you have some, some piece of custom software that you need to use to, um, to send your results someplace, um, you can write an archiver, plug it into the system, and tell your tasks to use it. Um, there is a well-documented API for this. Uh, the documentation still has a couple of rough edges in it, but we'll clean that up. Um, the big, the big advantages is that it is to this is that it allows people who have niche applications to bring them into the Personar fold and use Personar with them, um, so that uh, you know it's basically less less systems and less equipment to to field to get all of your measurement done. Um, technically speaking, as as once this has been out for a while, theoretically the core development team would not even need to be involved in this, um, other than maybe as as an advisory role. We do ask that people who want to develop new plugins for the next release or so um, get in touch with us and kind of just kind of go over it with us to make sure that we, A, that we get all the bugs out of the process and that, uh, that we kind of get people off on the right foot to do, do architecturally good plugins. Um, as I mentioned before, we have abstracted the notice, the notion of a test. Um, P Scheduler does this by defining essentially what the measurement is and what its parameters are. Um, so unlike Unlike BWCTL, where you'd say I'm going to do BWCTL or an IPER test, you do a throughput test. Um, ping, where you, where you did ping, you do round trip time. Where you did trace route, you did trace. Um, this is kind of this is important for us. It's it's a kind of a, a little bit of a distinction from what BWCTL did, um, but this will allow us to very easily do things like, for example, if if ESNet decides that they're done with IPER3 and they come up with IPER4 and it's lots better, all we have to do to support it is write a plugin and throughput tests will support it instantaneously. Um, there are provisions, we didn't, we didn't dumb this thing down to the lowest common denominator, so there are provisions to use uh, tool specific features and for selecting specific tools or sets of tools that you wanna use to run, the, um, to, to run your tests. Um, Technical improvements, um, what's going on under the hood. Um, there is a considerably simplified code base. Um, it was designed and put together in a way that it'll be very reliable and very maintainable. Um, most of the hard work is done um, with a PostgreSQL uh, relational database manager. Um, and all the, that, that saved us actually a huge amount of, of development work because 
Uh, we could do a lot of the heavy lifting and queries, uh, and we can have the database take care of enforcing all of our um, all of our integrity constraints and so forth, and it really makes for a, a good solid data store. Uh, there is a REST API for, um, for communicating with this. <clears throat> Excuse me, pretty much everything in the system, the command line interface and anything else that interacts with pscheduler does so through the REST API. So we have, we have eaten a whole bunch of our own dog food with this. Uh, documentation for that is forthcoming. Um, all, of the, uh, all the data formats that we use are all JSON, they're all fairly standard, and they're all documented. Um, so I guess now we'll talk about just a couple of sort of uh, here's what you used to do and here's what you do now type commands. Um, so pscheduler's interface is a little different than, uh, than BWCTL's was. Uh, so for example, to, to do a throughput test where you would say uh, BWCTL, the catching host, is received host and the uh, sending host is, is the sender, um, and maybe you do a, a T for duration of 30 seconds. In pscheduler, what you would do is you'd say pscheduler because the, all, the entire CLI is all based on uh, this front end thing called pscheduler. Uh, so you'd say pscheduler, you'd say task, which is how you tell it that you want to run a task. You tell it which task you want to run, throughput, uh, and then you give it a bunch of options. So in this case, we would say that the source host is send host, and this is entire, that one is entirely optional. If you leave it out, it assumes the local machine. Uh, dest is the destination, that's the receive host, and the duration is expressed as an ISO 8601 um, duration. So this PT 30 seconds represents 30 seconds. Um, you can do things like if you want to do a minute and five seconds, you could say PT 1M 30S, which is a minute and 30 seconds. Um, we have a link down at the bottom here um, for details on this. Um, contact sensitive help for all this is available right at the CLI. Just put uh, double dash help pretty much anywhere and you'll get, uh, you'll get options that are appropriate for that. Uh, similarly, here's, a, here's another couple of uh, comparative uh, latency and packet loss commands uh, where you used to do BW ping, fairly standard, you see the same thing, um, send host and receive host. Um, you would do in this case, if you're going to use, if you're going to do a round trip time test, you would say pscheduler task RTT uh, source, again, optional, and the destination is, is the receive host as well. Um, RTT and latency are actually two different tests. RT is round trip, obviously, and latency is one way. So where you used to say BW ping with the tool of OAMP um, and the rest of your, your parameters, you would say P scheduler task latency, source, uh, destination, packet count, all these are all these are spelled out. I'll explain why in a second. And a packet interval of dot zero one. I'm actually not sure that's correct. I'll have to take a look and see if that takes a an ISO 8601, because I think it does. Um, but one thing that's that's of note here with the with the longer um, with the longer uh, option names, all of these kind of match one for one the uh, the JSON that's used to specify these things. So if you're from if you get familiar with the the long form um, the long form argument names here, then writing the JSON if writing the JSON by hand if you want to import a task or something like that becomes a snap. Um, here's another one, trace route. Um, again, you kind of seeing a pattern emerge here, um, where you have uh, used to do BW trace route. Now you say P scheduler task trace, same sort of options, and what you get back are, are kind of the same, the same sort of results that you're used to. Um, one thing that's that's of note here is that when you're using the command line, it will look a lot like the output will look a lot like what you saw with BWCTL, um, but behind the scenes, all the results and stuff are all actually JSON. And what you see when you run the command line interface, because it's is is you know for human consumption, is is reconstituted from the JSON. But you'll be able to use the JSON for for applications where you want to machine read it. Um, big list of other other useful P scheduler commands. This is sort of just a, a a quick smattering of some of the things that are available. Um, there's a, a command where you can list what plugins are are installed. So you say P scheduler plugins tests. It'll show you what tests are installed. Um, you can do the same thing with uh, tools and archivers, um, just so you know what's available. Um, so the second one you can do, we have a, a test called clock that you can do where you can measure the clock difference between two hosts. That's sort of a, more, a much more important thing in pscheduler than it was in BWCTL. Um, because we have a timeline, it's actually much more important that the clocks be fairly close to actual time. Um, we, we generally build the tools so that they can tolerate up to a full second of slop. Um, but this is just sort of a good quick way to test it. Uh, we've written a few other tests. Um, 
the, the next one is uh, DNS. We have a test that, that does DNS queries and returns the results and measures the time to do it. That was just sort of a, a, a quick hitter that we did to kind of demonstrate that you can do more things than just the, just the usual um, the usual things um, that you're used to doing. And there'll probably be more of these as, as time goes on. Um, additionally, the last two, we have a couple, we have a command called schedule that will let you spit out uh, what the, what's on the schedule. Uh, we also have a nice command called monitor that's a little like top that shows you what's going on in real time. Um, but you can do things like you can filter by test. Uh, we will be expanding, expanding the filtering options a little bit uh, in the future. But you can also do things like you can say, uh, like if you look at the second command, uh, it says filter test throughput. So this is just pull out throughput uh, for the last hour until now on some other host. Um, all of pscheduler is all sort of, um, everything is sort of treated as third party, even things on the, on the local host that all just connects up to a server. So you can use this host switch to say, I wanna do this, but I wanna do it connected up to some other server. Um, we have a command called schedule plot that will let you plot the schedule. Uh, it just generates a PNG that you can open up and look at. Uh, this is sort of a useful thing for determining whether or not uh, you have test congestion. Um, what you see, there, there are four columns here. Uh, the one on the left is uh, time when you're running exclusive tests, which is pretty much, uh, pretty much throughput for now. Um, normal, we actually don't have anything that runs normal right now, but that's uh, for things that can run together, um, but have to stay out of the way of the exclusive things. And the big ugly black bar is, um, is things that, that run in the background. So in this case, because we have, a lot of, um, we have a lot of background latency tests going on, there's lots and lots going on there. And finally, the last, um, the last column is non-starters, which is sort of a new, uh, a new notion. Um, if, it's, if, it, if, a, if a run of a test was scheduled to happen at a particular time, like if you look on the left graph here, you can see one of these that's, um, that's I don't know, about uh, was scheduled for about 1245. If for some reason a run of a test can't be scheduled either because of uh, limits issues, because we, knew, we, we now have ways to restrict things, restrict things by time, or because it couldn't be scheduled with the other host that was involved, that, that run becomes what we call a non-starter. Um, I can talk about that some more in the future if, uh, if anyone's interested. But the, the whole, the whole uh, gist of this, in this case, this was uh, a couple of plots from a couple of hosts at ESnet, um, and they, they, looked at the, um, they looked at the amount of congestion in the exclusive side um, of the, uh, the one on the left and decided to move some of those to the, uh, to the machine on the right, which was a lot less congested. Finally, um, or almost finally, um, backward, backward compatibility with BWCTL. It is available. Um, we kind of don't recommend using it. Um, it's, it, it works just fine. Uh, we did it so that systems with 4.0 can uh, run tests to hosts that are still running 3.5. You can still run BWCTL from the command line. Um, there's no guarantee that, it, that what you do won't collide with a pscheduler test. Um, and that's also similar if you're going to do BWCTL to another 4.0 host. We do run the BWCTL daemon, so if you're going to test from a, a, a 3.5 host to a 4.0 host, you can, and it'll all work like it used to. But again, you have the, the caveat that it's um, that it not um, that it, that you may not you may not avoid collisions doing it. Uh, let's see, archivers. We're almost to the end here. Uh, I think I mentioned this before, we have support for Esmond for uh, HTTP, RabbitMQ. You can also dump your test to the syslog. Um, these are, like I said before, these are also pluggable uh, with a well-defined API. It makes it real easy to, to, uh, to define new archiving targets. Uh, most of these, once you understand the API, um, or not, once, when, once you understand how they interface to the system, uh, writing archivers is, is kind of dead simple, so we expect that there'll probably be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ecosystem for these. Uh, as I mentioned before, archiving is reliable so that uh, if, you're, if your measurement archive goes up in smoke for a while, you'll be able to, to get the data dumped on it when it comes back up. Um, let's see. Finally, uh, just on uh, packaging, pscheduler was actually designed to be standalone. You can run it without the rest of Personar if you want. Um, all of the test tool and archiver plugins that we ship are individually installable packages. Um, so you can add plugins to systems that need them. Additionally, if for some security reason you don't want to plug in on, you know, like if you don't want, if you don't, if you have a system that you don't want, say, um, any kind of throughput measurements to be done on, 
your, your choices are either to uh, limit them in the limits configuration or you can simply remove the plugins entirely and pscheduler becomes unaware that any of that exists at all. So that's kind of a, um, kind of a, a new thing there. Um, so I think that's it for me. It looks like there was a whole bunch of, um, there was a whole bunch of discussion in chat here while I was talking. Um, and it doesn't look like much of it was specific to, to P-Scheduler. But if you have questions, I'll hang around at the end. Oh, one question is about scheduling uh, for specific times, like after hours. Maybe just address that real quick. Yeah, sure. Um, you have a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, one of them is like, I, actually, I'll give you a great example. Um, scheduling is, is, is pretty much uh, straight repetition so that you can say, you know, I want to do this. Um, I want to do this every hour. You can either run something where you say, like, let's, let's say you want to run things between, if you have a specific job that you want to run, say, hourly between midnight and 6 a.m., you can say, here's a task. I want to start it at midnight on this date. I want to run it hourly six times. The other way that you can do it um, is using limits. You can say certain types of tests, for example, like uh, high bandwidth throughput tests, you can only be run between midnight and 6 a.m. And if somebody puts an hourly test on there, what will ha happen is, during the, the restricted time, all those runs will just come up as non-starters. There'll be a little diagnostic in there that says that the limits precluded it. And then once the runs get the runs that are scheduled for the non-restricted hours, midnight to six, will run just fine because the limits don't restrict them. Um, so yeah, there are there are ways to do that. Okay, excellent. And um, so I've got a few more slides and then just to address another one real quick that I saw in there and I think was addressed in chat, but just so everyone hears it. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, there is no change in the recommendation for um, doing uh, latency tests on one interface and throughput tests on another interface. We, we still support that. Um, ESNet has a deployment that's all upgraded to 4.0. That's exactly what we do. Um, um, I think it's about 50 hosts there. Um, so so that none of that's changed. You can still do that and, and that works works basically the same at the end of the day. So, um, okay, with that being said, I'll, I'll jump into these last couple slides and then uh, we'll take uh, a few more questions at the end. So I just wanna highlight a few few more things uh, just related to the upgrade process and, and all that. Um, there we go. Uh, so just, this is actually really more of a recap. It's not necessarily new. Uh, you know, there's been some slight changes since, you know, Peace Guys is a component now, but uh, you know, Persona, I think a lot of people just use the, the what we call the toolkit uh, bundle. You know, you probably install it from an ISO at some point and you have our web interface and basically the whole package uh, uh, of everything. But it is actually possible to install just, you know, um, um, subsets of, of the tools, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so just to kind of recap those, the kind of simplest package we have is called Personar-Tools, uh, and that includes basically just the measurement tools, so like that purple box I showed earlier, um, so iPerf, iPerf3, uh, new CCP, um, it still includes BWCL for the time being, um, and, and OAMP, and then uh, it'll also include just the pscheduler client program, so you won't pull in Postgres or anything like that, and you won't be actually, you know, maintaining a schedule on that host, but if you want to talk to a pscheduler server, on run some of those commands. Mark was showing you, you do have some ability to do that with, uh, with the pscheduler's client command. Um, then it kind of moving up a layer is the persona test point. So that includes all the tools, but then it adds the full pscheduler installation and the lookup service registration daemon. So then you can do kind of full schedule of the tests. Um, it also has the mesh config that, that should be added on here too. Um, so, so basically you can do kind of the full, full test scheduling thing. Um, and this is most useful for people who um, are publishing to a central MA. Um, and, and also running like probably a mesh config too to configure their tests, like a remote mesh. Um, and then kind of moving up is the persona core. So that adds all the test point stuff, but then it adds esmenon, which is our measurement archive. So that's if you want to store tests locally, um, that as you, gives you the ability to do that. And then last is the persona toolkit, which I think most people are familiar with. That in, adds in all the web interface stuff for setting up tests and, and all those things. It also adds in all our packages for setting up firewalls and system control setting, sys control settings, and and all that type of stuff that we just apply that happens by default. Um, it should also probably be worth mentioning stuff like these firewall settings um, and the syscontrol stuff are actually available in separate, separate packages. So if you want to pull in any of that and if you're running tools or test point of core, you can do that separately. Um, it's, we kind of wanted to give people a menu of options because the kind of the point of the, the tools test point and core is, you know, you might be running configuration management or want to manage some of that stuff yourself for, for whatever reason. 
those give you the ability to do that. If there are certain things you would still like our defaults for, you can pull those in kind of piece by piece. Um, none of that, like I said, none of those actually new in 4.0, but I don't know that a lot of people are aware of that ability and, and I think it can sometimes be confusing. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and like I said, the Persona Toolkit uh, is what most people use. We're still providing the ISOs for the Persona Toolkit if you're doing a fresh, you know, a complete new install. I think as I said earlier, uh, those ISOs are now only based on CentOS 7. Uh, there is no CentOS 6 ISO anymore, so that means any new installs using the ISOs will have to be on CentOS 7. Um, uh, so we, we talked about this a lot in kind of our emails leading up to the 4.0 release. Um, we sent kind of multiple emails about this. Um, you know, in order to get some of the new functionality that was shown today um, in, in Peace Cubs or in otherwise, um, uh, you know, it, it basically requires a little bit more CPU uh, than in the previous version. Um, uh, and really, that, that's the biggest change requirement-wise. Um, so th this graph shows some of that. It, it, uh, it was actually, you know, uh, Persona was actually pretty coasty in, in 3.5. Uh, it, it wasn't using a ton of CPU. So I think it says, it's, you know, shows it's about double uh, here. Um, so it's, it's not horrible, but it is, it is noticeable if you're monitoring these things, especially if you have a lot of tests. In particular, if you have a lot of OAMP tests that write frequently to the archiver, a lot of it is actually coming from just the process of, 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 of writing to the archiver, and it's just there's more processes and things like that. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time optimizing that over the past few months. So, I mean, it, we got it to a level that we were comfortable with it. So, you know, it hopefully isn't blowing up your host or anything like that. Um, but, uh, but, but that is something I wanted to highlight because it's a change. And if your mind is things, it'll be different. Um, you know, beyond 4.0, you know, we might look at optimizing things even more if, if we can. But, um, you know, we, this is just something we want to point out to people. Um, kind of a breakdown of the requirements a little bit more. Um, too, you know, I talked about all those bundles and some of them don't run the full set of tools. So as you can imagine, as you go up the stack, it's is when um, uh, requirements are increased. So, you know, the tools are just the, the command line tools. They, they don't require a whole lot to run those. Uh, if you're doing a test point, which uh, is the tools plus basically P scheduler, uh, the, that we recommend another core and, and, and at least two gigs of RAM. It largely depends on, how, again, how many tests you're running in particular, how many OAMP tests you're running, and how, you know, if they're, if they're writing uh, a lot uh, to the archive. Um, so you can probably get away with a little less RAM there. And then once you start adding on the, uh, 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 the measurement archive, that, that's where the RAM requirements kind of definitely become more binding. So uh, core and toolkit are essentially the same. Uh, you know, minus the GUI, so that doesn't really change the requirements much, but that, that breakdown is there if you're interested. Um, and then, of course, upgrading CentOS 7. So I'll highlight a timeline at the end, but, um, you know, obviously we won't support CentOS 6 forever. Um, so, you know, we're encouraging people to upgrade to CentOS 7, you know, as they can. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to do it. Um, basically, in general, just newer package versions of a lot of things. Um, in particular, for us, uh, Python 2.7 is a big help with, with Asmin. We do some really weird stuff on CentOS 6 with how we uh, run kind of multiple versions of HCBD and, you know, trying not to bump into things, multiple versions of mod WSGI. If you've, you've run into any of those yourself, uh, we have to do lots of weird stuff to get around that. That all goes away in CentOS 7. There's a lot of nice kernel features in uh, CentOS 7, like uh, FQ-based pasting and, and all that. Um, some of the U limits are a little bit nicer if you're running lots of tests. Um, probably most of you won't run into that, but um, a few of you might. It's just it, it's a little bit a little bit easier. Um, uh, better virtualization and container support, and, and uh, kind of and you know a further out end of life. So um, unfortunately, CentOS 7. This is a CentOS thing. This is not a Persona thing. It just it requires a, a complete reinstall. Um, and probably uh, for a lot of you who've been around, you probably remember this when we went from CentOS 5 to CentOS 6. It's just it's kind of the way things are when you do these major OS upgrades. Um, but we do have scripts to help you migrate your data and all that over. Um, that's documented on the page shown there. Um, so hopefully people will be able to try that. Um, and then one final note on uh, low cost hardware. So a lot of people are um, really interested in running Persona on these so-called small nodes. Um, we still support that. Obviously there's some higher CPU requirements, so more potential for bottlenecks and things like that. Um, but uh, we actually have a, a, a test bed of, of small nodes uh, that, that we kind of watch during development and, and put a lot of the stuff on early. Um, so there's still setups out there that work, um, it, uh, and there's some deployment examples at that page. I won't go into a ton of detail on that. Um, you know, it, it is worth noting, like, you know, the, the Raspberry Pi level, really, if you're trying to do much more than just, you know, your basic OAMP, um, you know, 
tests and stuff like that, that, that that's kind of always been the case. We've never really supported like a full two page toolkit on a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. So um, I don't think a ton has changed here, but you do just need to be a little bit more conscientious, I guess, of the CPU now. So um, so final final thing to cover before we get into any last questions is uh, t basically timeline going forward. Um, so obviously this past Monday, we did the, the Persona 4.0 release. Um, so what we'll probably do this summer is do another, uh, you know, we'll call it 401 and probably do another bug fix and minor feature release. This will include probably some of the improvements that Michael talked about up to the graphs and maybe some other small stuff, nothing major, just, just, we expect a lot of feedback and, you know, since this is such a large change and we just, you know, want to probably get something out quickly. Um, if there are, you know, uh, you know, we won't make no changes between now and then. So for example, you know, there's been a couple kind of smaller issues that people have run into over the past couple of days and we pushed out some fixes last night to like the NDT firewall rules that I talked about. Uh, there were some issues with the graphs and HTTP and HBS getting mixed that were causing trouble for people. We pushed out a fix for that last night. We'll, we'll push out little things like that that are kind of, you know, deployment blocking or, you know, just, uh, you know, really common and, and small before that. But we'll do a uh, formal, formal minor release in, in the summer. Um, and then October, which is six months exactly after the 4.0 release, that's when we will end of life 351. That's just the timeline we've always done for end of life in um, previous versions is six months after the release of, of the newest version. Um, that also means we will no longer be providing Web 100 builds at that time, since so 3.5.1 is the last version of Persona that required Web 100. And that also means that we will not be supporting NDT on Persona anymore uh, after October um, because it requires Web 100. So, um, then kind of, you know, I put asterisks by these things that are subject to change. Um, so we're kind of targeting for January of next year to do a 4.1 release, which would be, you know, a bigger release. Um, and we'll share more info on that as we get closer to it and um, kind of, you know, finalize our planning, planning for all that. Um, but one thing that is definite is we will not be releasing 4.1 on CentOS 6. Um, and we also are not planning to include Bees of CL with that, with that release. Um, so those will be changes. So that means then um, roughly, you know, six months after that release is when we'll end up like 4.0. Since 4.0 is the last version we're doing on CentOS 6, that means July of next year, so 2018, is when we would likely drop support of CentOS 6. Now, again, obviously that's a little subject to change depending on when we get things out. I will say we don't tend to get things out earlier than we project. So <laughs> those are probably, uh, best case scenarios in terms of how early we would end up like things and people will keep updating this timeline, you know, as, as uh, uh, we get closer to, to, to the date. So, um, all right, and that's all I have. We will, I, this was asked in chat. Um, we will be sharing these slides afterwards and there's a recording of this presentation, so we will upload that. We will share details on the list and the exact locations of those once we have them uploaded. Um, and there's some references here at the end for, you know, for sure really more useful if you're, if you're um, uh, reading these slides. So. Um, I think that's that's all we have. So I, I haven't been watching chat. I can look and see if there's any any additional questions. Um, all right. Just let me scroll up here. Looks like there is. Uh, all right. Um, so there's a question, uh, oh, there's a question on where you can find the limits documentation. So that's on docs.personar.net. Uh, there's a section running tests with pscheduler and there's a, I think there's a pointer to the limits there. Um, so, so there's a, there's a, there's an entire page dedicated to the limits. It's, it's linked from docs.personar.net. Um, and, and it's not with the mesh config documentation. It's, 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 own, it's its own page with the pscheduler documentation. Um, you can send CLI tasks to the archiver, um, and if they get sent to the archiver, they can then be graphed. Um, that's a special, there's a special option for that. We also have that documented on docs.personar on that. Again, it's in that piece schedule uh, section. Um, there's a one on creating tasks with, with piece schedule as an example of that. The other option I think that Mark's talking about is um, there's the ability to basically drop a config file on the server, so any task that's run to the server can get shipped to an archiver as well. That, that, that's another way to do it. Um, all right, there's lots of support questions. 
I was able to install my Dash on CentOS 7 without troubleshooting it. That was the question. <laughs> um, any plans to provide Docker images? Um, yeah, that's something we're talking about. Um, but yeah, not not yet. There is, I think, a Docker image that was posted. It's not an official, officially supported thing, but uh, uh, I think Ryan Tierney's kind of been keeping it up to date unofficially, so uh, that's there. And there's a discussion on that page that uh, Simone linked to. Um, uh, Sorry, just trying to trying to pick through these. Yeah, somebody asked about a specific configuration for running 10 gigs on a small node. I think Mark gave the right answer. You, you kind of got to try it with some of those small nodes. There's a, there's a lot of factors into going how much you can squeeze out of them. So um, yeah, d definitely give it a try. It's not out of the realm of possibilities what you got lined there. Um, yeah, so the Magic server not running is not a common problem. So yeah, please, please hit our user list with that. And I think that's everything. Mark or Michael, anything or anybody else, anything big I missed? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Yeah, I was sort of I was sort of skating through I think all of the ones you've either addressed or have been addressed in chat. But um, you know, again, if there are questions that we missed today, uh person or user list, uh, make sure you send them there and we'll answer them quickly. Oh, and last question, any any plans for re-injured NDT functionality in Persona? No, that, that's an emphatic no. So that that is that is out of Persona. Like I said, see my slide for, for what the future of NDT is, but yeah, those, that, that, those are separate paths. So no, no, no plans for that. <laughs> What's on the bookshelf behind Andy? So <laughs> uh, signs that I haven't completely grown up is, is what those are. So. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's everything. So thank you everyone for joining. And yeah, like we've said, please, please send any issues to the list. Um, and uh, we'll be posting all this, uh, all this information uh, on the web and sharing it with you. So thanks everyone for joining.